As we approach the semi-finals of the Gallagher Premiership season, we have a great special guest joining us for you today. Coming on to discuss England rugby, the back three, sail sharks and much, much more is former sail and England winger Mark Cueto. The Gallagher Premiership top four was done and dusted even before this past weekend's final round of fixtures, but we are now pre previewing semi-final weekend. Um, and today we've got a great special guest to do that, especially given how strong Sail are looking at the moment, in former Sail Shark and England winger Mark Cueto. How are you, Mark? Very well, thank you, Ollie. Very well. What are you up to nowadays? Uh, what am I up to these days? Um, I still work for Sail Sharks. I still, um, I was, I was running. I so when I retired, when did I retire, mate? Two thousand fifth, coming up to eight years uh, in May. Um, and for the first four, four five years, I was managing their commercial, uh, all, everything commercial essentially. Um, I was commercial director there. Um, it was interesting. Um, the commercial side of rugby, well, the commercial side of the premiership is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, it's uh, one thing you haven't got a clue about when you're on when you when you're on the other side of the, the fence as it were playing um, and everything's rosy. And then um, I do I do a bit of speaking. Um, luckily I, I get to work at, at Twickenham for, for most of the home games, um, which is great. Um, and bizarrely, um, the office that I'm in at the moment, um, I've got a business called The Fourth Utility, um, and I set it up with, um, there was five or six of us, original sort of founder shareholders in 2017. We, we, we put fibre broadband into apartment blocks, essentially. Um, and we... For three years, we we all just sort of funded it ourselves and chucked a little bit of money in, and we were all doing other jobs. And then 2020, we 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 landed a, a decent chunk of investment, um, which allowed us to all sort of take a salary and, and go full time. And and here we are. So um, yeah, it, it the, the the commercial side of, of rugby is frustrating to say the least. Um, as we all know, the game's in a in a bit of a mess. Who knows where it's going? Two clubs going to bump this season. <laughs> Another one, you know, London Irish. Not sure where or what's happening there. Um, probably a, a, a whole other conversation to be had on that. Um, I've got some real gripes with it, with sort of the, the way it's ran and everything else. I think it can be fixed. Not 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 simply. Um, but for me, there's there's an easy way to to at least give it a chance. Um, but as I said, it's another another conversation. So it was nice. We we landed 50, 50 million quid here in twenty twenty, just be, just just as COVID hit, bizarrely. Um, so I've I've been full time here. I think for twelve for six six months, I sort of spent half my time at sale, half my time here. To the point where I needed to sort of be in here full time, and um, it's it's only about a third of a mile down the road from from where I live, and I still drive here every day in a Range Rover. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's good, it's good, and it's it's going really well. Um, so that's me, that's me at the moment. I'd like to say, I'd like to say, Mark, that uh, I mean a Range Rover is disappointing because you were a Rolls Royce of a week. Ah, very good, very good, very good. When you stop playing, and, and yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I was, you know, grown up in having grown up in Bath, and I have a lot to do with with Bath Club and being close to the things that happened there years. Yeah, ago. yeah. Is is it easy to stop playing and then go into any kind of managerial capacity? A club which is by by definition full of people that you've had a completely different relationship with, because you've had a playing relationship. I mean, I mean it caused a lot of trouble at Bath back in the day. Yeah, so with people I thinking that their mates know. were letting them down and all that kind of thing. I, I, don't, I don't know how it worked. I think, I think I, I, what I've what I've learned with, with, with uh, uh, you know a lot um, since sort of retiring and being in business and. 
and everything else. The, the, like you say there, if you, you've got to take the emotion out of everything. And yes, yeah, someone might be a mate, but then they, they can't expect, if they're not doing a job and they're not delivering what they're supposed to be delivering at the, at the level that they're supposed to be at, they can't expect just to keep that position or keep that job because the mates with you. Now that's, whether that's sport or business, that's, that's the same for me. Now going back to your original question, yeah, it, I think it's always going to be difficult. And, and what gives you the divide? Look at just, there's a lot of football fans in the office here. And I walked in today and they're talking about Frank Lampard. And, you know, what, what gives you the divine right just because you're a good player? To, and you never see it in any other industry, do you? You never see someone that's never, ever done a job in their whole life, you know, and then be, and then be, go from playing and, yeah, absolutely world class player. So then being the top, the top manager, the, you know, of, of an organisation, he's never, ever done it in his life. You, you don't see it any in anything else but sport, right? Now, the flip side of that is a good mate of mine, Richard Wigglesworth, that you, you'll all know well, he got, he got, he got chucked in, in the deep end with both us leaving. And, and I think I, I used to say to him prior to Steve getting the England job, um, I said, mate, you need you need to let more people know how involved you are in that coaching setup at, 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 at Leicester. Because at the minute, I I know I knew how much he was doing because I mean he's one of his best mates and he was, he's he's ended up moving around the corner from me in Manchester, bizarrely. Um, but I said, people people on the outside don't don't know, um, and it could end up sort of tripping you up. Really, you need to sort of almost publicise yourself a little bit more. Now, he's been chucked in and he's done a fantastic job. Now, it's helped because, obviously, he's not just gone purely from playing to being a director of rugby at, say, um, at Tigers. He's gone from being a player coach, you know, running running the attack, essentially, the team the team attack and the, and the back of, and, the, and the, the general backs attack. And he was running that for... Uh, probably a good so the, the year they won the league he was doing it all then and obviously you know there was Kev there was a couple of other guys and, and then obviously both of us um, and so he's gone from he's, he's gone from you know having that experience albeit short term to you know essentially running, running the show taking over from Steve and not only taking over from Steve but Steve took Kev straight away so you know Kev's his Kev's his defence coach, which is, you know, essentially you've, you've got your DOR and then you've maybe got, obviously, the the, the, the wider coaching teams ginormous now. Um, you know, there's, there's, if you include S&C S &C and everything, there's, you know, the, take the medical side out of it. But, you know, you, you, you're talking 10, 15 men, a, a, a person, team, um, below, below your director of rugby. And essentially there's sort of three or four major heads within that 15 man team, and that's your, your defense coach, your attack coach, your head of SSC. Now, not only did Steve step away and Wiggy took over, but Steve, Steve took the defense coach, which is one of the biggest roles within that, within that, within that small team. And, you know, Frinter, you know, to well, hopefully we'll, sm we'll smash him on Saturday. There'll be no emo there'll be no emotion there on Saturday. Um, I'd, I'd love him to win and I'd love him to get to a final, but I said to him on, on Saturday, because he's panicking a bit. They lost to Quinns at home last week. We obviously beat uh, New, um, Newcastle convincingly. And um, and I said, mate, you, you can hold your head. You can hold your head up massively high off, off, you know, whether you lose, whether you lose on Saturday or not, obviously you win, then even better. But if you lose, mate, don't, don't be mistaken from, you know, from what you've, what you've done in, in such a short period. Um, at, at, at Leicester, mate, you know, from a massive disruption, and you know, we all talk about new coaches coming in and how it takes six months for them to settle, and da, 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 da. but I can't remember where they were in the league when when he took over. But he, I think he's done a, an unbelievable job. So I'm obviously biased because he's my mate. But going back to the original question, can can a player step into into that role? It, it, it's like it's like every it's like with everything for me. <laughs> not to get all political, but 
whether you're, you're, you're black, white, male, female, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. If you're the, the right person for our role, then you're the right person. So if, if you're a player that's flipped straight into being a DOR, you're the right person. If you get getting results and you get into you get into semi-finals or you get into finals, not, well, that doesn't mean that if you're not getting to a semi-final or a final, you're not the right person. But if you're losing every game for six months, having took over the DOR, you're probably not the right person, right? So I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm quite sort of black and white and try to keep things pretty simple in life. And for me, essentially, it's all, it's all, everything's about performance. Everything's about performance. I think, Wait, I think, can, I, can I put you on the spot a little bit on that one? Brian yeah. Johnson, as good a player in his own right as this country's ever produced. Yeah. He got parachuted in to an England job off the back of no experience as a manager yeah. and coach. Yeah. Now, but, but the thing about Jono, I, I think history might look back a little bit kinder. 2011, you had a match to win the Grand Slam. World Cup quarter final. Okay, one really poor performance in the World Cup. That wasn't a disastrous year. I think England won 10 or 11 of their 13 yeah. games. And he's out. Mate. Having got, learned, got, done the hard yards yeah. and learned. As you say, I, I, I'm doing a dinner on Friday night at Solly Hall Rugby Club of all places. And look, you, you compare 2007 to 2011 and the, the two teams, the preparation, the results, they couldn't have been more at opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, 2007, I think we came third, if not maybe fourth in the Six Nations. Um, Ash, Brian Ashton took a squad. He took like a second team to to South Africa, you know, with a with a view of didn't want people to get injured. But he took a second team to South Africa pre World Cup. They conceded over a hundred points in two Test matches in South Africa. Yet we go to the World Cup in a fucking mess, and somehow Wangle Wangle get to the World Cup final, right? So. It, it was just a, a disaster. Fuck knows, fuck knows how it even happened. Whereas you go to 2011, as you said, that that to that Six Nations, we we went to Ireland for a Grand Slam. It was my 50th cap. We went to Ireland for a Grand Slam, and they did a job on us. But we, you know, not that it matters, but essentially we still won the Six Nations, which was the first time England had won the Six Nations. Yeah, we missed out on the Grand Slam, and it was bizarre trying to celebrate afterwards with John Inverdale presenting us all with the with the Six Nations trophy. We're all like, "This is shit." We just lost, but we won a Six Nations, right? Where did we tour? Where did we tour pre World Cup? Australia. We went to Australia pre World Cup 2011, and we we drew a series. There was only two Test matches, but we we lost the first one. And we won the second one. And it was the first time an England team had won in, in Australia since 2011. We then get to the World Cup. Fight, uh, the World Cup. Uh, we, we, we're we undefeated in four in our first four pool matches. We only conceded one try. And I think we scored 19 in four games. Now, at that point, where, you know, go back to 2011 and the record that we'd had and we'd been spanked by South Africa in that second game. At, at that point, there's only one team that's winning this conversation, right, or this comparison, and it's 2011. But we get beaten in a quarter final against France. We went on to to the final and possibly, nearly could have beat New Zealand. Yet yeah, there's a few instances off the field that that we let ourselves down with, and, and essentially that 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 tarnished everybody's. Everybody got tarnished with the same brush, and and, and essentially, Jono, Jono, did Jono, didn't it? it did yeah, and I, I remember saying at the time, I remember saying, Jono, obviously, Jono's Jono, right? And I, I still believe that he should have kept the job. He should have kept the job um, because if with the experience of that twelve months under his belt, and essentially. It was probably the best 12. Because there's a lot of failure around it, it's hard to sort of try and portray how much success there was in that year. As I said, we won a Six Nations. We won it in, in Australia. Um, the World Cup was going brilliant until the knockout and we lose against a brilliant French team. It was it was the most success, successful 12 months that England has had for 10-odd years. And it was down to Jono and, the, and, the, and, the, and everything that he put in place. Now, 
if he'd have been able to keep the job for the next four years, rather than giving it to Stuart, then, you know, we don't know what would have happened with it. With, you know, we end up having the, the worst performance in a World Cup competition ever and getting knocked. We don't even qualify for the knockout stages in our own backyard. So I I was devastated for Jono. Um, um, he walked away though, didn't he? I mean, Martin wasn't sacked. Martin, Martin walked nah, away. Nah, yeah, but mate, come on. I, I, there's, a, there's a cost there. There's a cost of 100 metres on the road here. And Stuart Lancaster rang me up to to meet me, and it was just before Six Nations 2012, whatever. And um, fair play, he he drove up to Manchester to meet me face to face. He didn't just ring me, but essentially was coming up because he'd done it already with Nick Easter, with you know Tyndall, Moody, Wilker. There was a load of the sort of the older older fellas that he basically said, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, gonna include you in the Six Nations squad," and. Um, he, he's, he was essentially coming up to tell me that. And did I want to announce my retirement before I wasn't picked in the squad to Sky Sports and all that shit? And I'm thinking, fuck off. There's no, you're, you're a school teacher from Leeds. There's no way you're going to have this job after the Six Nations. Someone more, more experienced, you'll have a shock in the Six Nations. Someone more experienced will come in after the Six Nations. I'll be back. There's a tour to South Africa in the summer. I'll be back here. I'll be <laughs> I'll be back in. I'll be back in from a final hurrah. Um, I've missed out. I've missed out on the South Africa tour twice. Uh, once because of injury, and the second one because oh, pre pre World Cup 07, I actually didn't want to take anyone that was taken to the World Cup. I was desperate to go, so I thought, oh, this is my fucking chance. And uh, yeah, that 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 plan, how I saw it panning out, didn't certainly didn't pan out. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so it's so yeah. Going back to John, I mean, it was more a case of that, and I don't I don't know this for for fact, but it was it was probably more a case of that they gave him the opportunity to walk away before, you know, for want of a better term, you know, he had sort of egg on his face publicly and was, you know, was sacked following following the um, the antics in the south in New Zealand. Yeah, I mean. Wait, look, looking back on it, I mean, that was the, uh, look, I mean, we all make errors of judgment and it's, and it's, you know, I mean, he was very um, early in in his sort of managerial uh, career. The thing about that was that that was always going to spiral out of control. Once the story had broken, that was always going to get, going to get worse unless, yeah. he, unless he cauterized the wound immediately. And I'll tell you now that I reckon that if he dropped Mike Tindall straight off, just said, right, you're out for one or two games, yeah. that's the, the punishment. That would have cauterized yeah. it to a degree. You and know, they would you would have been able to get back on track. Mate, you're right, you're right. And do you know what's crazy, Nick? We I can't remember the name of the guy now. You you guys will know. So we have a new head of media and PR and, and Will it, Chignall. Cheers. Yeah. Will Chignall. Will fucking Chignall. Will fucking Chignall. So this genius, this genius fucking media PR. I don't know how much of this is going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so what? I'll try and um, I'll try and soften it. Um, so obviously, Will Will comes over from working for Sky Sports for 10, 20 odd years, whatever. Um, when when everything happened with Tins, all Tins wanted to do was face the press and tell them what had actually gone on and apologise for anything he needed to apologise for, right? Jono agreed. The whole team, the whole senior um, players agreed. Will Chignall's advice was to not do that and to, to put up a barrier, to put up a barrier. We're like, fuck well, me. We're like... That's the worst thing to do with the press, right? Now, we are like, like you know, I, I'm sure no footballers have a have a conversation like this with, with when they're doing press, right? We we have a totally different relationship with you, and as you said, Chris, at the start, I've always you've always done all you guys have always done all right by me. I I completely agree, right? If if that had have happened, and that was what we all wanted to happen, it it have been, you know. A, a storm in a teacup or whatever the, the, the saying is. Um, 
essentially it was wrong what we did. Not that it makes a difference, but the same bar that the the so-called incident happened outside the week earlier, Brian O'Driscoll was being sick in a fucking gutter, and nobody nobody took a picture or nobody mentioned that. The fact that we did it, the fact that we went out, not to be the the, the golden boy here, right? But I wasn't even drinking because I was doing um I was doing a rehab session the next day, so I um I wasn't drinking that afternoon. But the fact that we we stayed, so we went out earlier in the in the afternoon, and it was a long turnaround to the next game. We'd just beaten Argentina, whatever, and um, we're like, right, we'll have a couple of pints, and then I think we had a couple of pints before we were meant to be heading home at 4 or 5 p.m. to go back to the hotel, have a bit of dinner, whatever. And as we're heading home, there's this bar that's off the charts, like, looks brilliant. You know, there's like, <laughs> not quite literally a neon, a neon light saying, dwarf, dwarf throwing inside, come in. But <laughs> it was that, you know, when you, when you made the wrong decision and you look back now and you're like, do we take the left road and go home or do we take the right road and stay out? And we 100%, we're in a fucking World Cup. We're, in a, we're, in, we're 10 days into a World Cup. Um, why the why the hell we decided to stay? I have no idea. So that was obviously the first mistake. But but no, going going back to the, to the question, that was what we all wanted to do. We were like, this is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, it's, it's just a, a sideshow of itself, of its own. Um, why Why would we put up a barrier? Why would we lie? We've got nothing to hide. We've got nothing to hide. Tins wants to apologise. The lads want to apologise for whatever. Let's just get it out and, and put it behind us. Mark, do you think that it, it, it you know, I mean, looking back, it, it may be that the, that the playing side was you know, was separate enough for it not to have an influence. But I can't believe that that I, I've, I've, I've always thought that that effectively torpedoed you. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Cause it just, it just knocked on to, to other events and it was never buried. It's, it's, like, it's like when you have an argument with the missus, isn't it? You can either bury it straight away and put your hand up and don't admit to everything, but stick your hand up and say, sorry. And it's done the next day, or it's the silent treatment, it's the banging the door for for a week, isn't it? And <laughs> we 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 didn't say. It. Obviously, we we went down that second where we don't say anything. Everyone starts to speculate what's going on. Then Zara, I remember Zara was coming over. She was coming over anyway. Um, I think she was already in Australia looking looking for horses that she did every year. It, you know, it wasn't just. She was, she was, she was doing it because she was, you know, it was made out. She was, it was a because they just got married that summer, right? So it was like, oh, it, it, you know, it's, it's, um, I can't think of the word, but um, SOS visit, <laughs> yeah, sort of thing, yeah. Um, and I remember um, the the morning that she arrived, Tin Tin rang me up. We we were, I can't remember where we were, and he said, oh. It's just, you know, I think we either had a day off or we, we, you know, we weren't doing a lot. And I was in my room. And Tins ran me up and he says, oh, Zara's just got here. Um, she fancy coming for some breakfast. Um, there's, she's got a mate with her, whatever. So before I was jumping the car and going for breakfast. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like a scene out of a movie. So we, we she's parked under, under, underground. So we jump in this car and I'm literally like, like totally naive to all this, right? And I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be nice. We nip out and have a bit of breakfast. Um, we pull out the hotel, sort of the you know, come from under up, up, the, up the ramp from under the, the underground car park. Pull out the hotel, and it was like a fucking wacky races. There must have been fifteen cars with cameramen hanging out the windows. And I was in one. I was in one of them. And, yeah. um, and it was it was in Dunedin. Dunedin, Dunedin, it was in, yeah. It was in yeah. Dunedin, yeah. And it's like, we ended up going through fucking red lights, going around the roundabouts the wrong way. So we're then, I'm, on the, I'm on the second floor of, um, of the office here, right? And I don't know if you can see, there's a tree, you know, you can't quite see, there's a tree outside. So we, 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 we get in this calf, 
barely fucking survived the, the, the travel there. And then um, I think Tim was like, right, we need to go, we need to go upstairs in the back so that nobody can sort of picture us if you're on the ground level in the front window, dead easy, right? So we go, we go upstairs, we go to the back, and we think we're fine. And five minutes later, this fucking bloke scaling trees outside with, with long lens cameras to take. I'm like, ah. And it's Why did you do it, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, that way you put it, your back it, out. Chris. It took me hours to get back down. <laughs> but it was just, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, this was seven or ten days on from that incident that we weren't talking about and we were putting up our, our brick wall barrier to the press. So it, it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed and it was just becoming ridiculous. It's in, a really... In truth, Martin was, Martin as a player was never particularly comfortable with the press he didn't like the, he didn't like the scene he didn't really trust it i don't yeah. i don't think and that's fine i mean look yeah. seriously i've been working it all my life i get that some people find it easier to be in that environment matt dawson yeah. Austin healy or whoever they can think yeah. of that stuff there yeah. are people like yeah. martin, that public facing role martin yeah. adapted to as best he could but he wasn't a natural just because, just because you're a great horse doesn't mean to say you're a great jockey. You know, it, it takes it takes time, and it didn't particularly yeah. suit his personality. He did his best with it, but when that happened, it, that level of scrutiny at a world yeah. cup involving Mike of all people because of his is exactly his, is it because of everything but this, else. But this wasn't. Was, but as I keep saying, this wasn't his decision. This no, no, no. You know, it was no. like I said, you've been. It was Sol's law, wasn't it? It was Sol's yeah. law. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah, a massive. I massive guess yeah, the, the thing about it is, is that, you know, Jono was, was, <clears throat> was inexperienced as a manager. And in, in that sort of situation, I think that anybody who's, who's not been in a job very long, you've got professionals alongside you whose advice you're going to take. And the yeah. top man basically said, this is the way to handle the press. And mm. he took that. If he'd been in the job for 15 or 20 years, he might maybe. well have said, sorry, mate. Or may that's yeah. not or maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe even two or three years, who knows? But yeah, for no, sure. I, I and and then to add, in, to add insult to injury, of course, after the World Cup, you had that report that was commissioned or the, the players' oh. questionnaire, which then got leaked. Which, yeah. which was which was an interesting decision to say the least, and that yeah. was that was the worst conceivable thing that could have happened. Well, again, again, then you know, uh, uh, not that I'm the you know whiter than white, but I remember when when we got asked to do this 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 anonymous Q um, um, questionnaire, and you know myself along with you know a, a dozen of the senior boys were like. Why, why, why are we going to fill a questionnaire in? And honestly, let's, you know, we're all grown men. Let's just sit in a room and talk and, and, and have an honest, an honest, open discussion about what was good and what was bad. And I, I, I don't know for definite, but I, I know I certainly didn't fill a questionnaire in. And I know a lot of my sort of more senior players didn't. Um, and I, I, I always, you know, I always thought it was like younger, younger lads that, again, maybe were a bit naive, and you know, who who knows? But it was it's classic RFU, right? Who the fuck does an anonymous Q and A? Why why we're all on the same team here? <laughs> let's let's sit let's sit around the table, the big fucking table, like you've got at Twickenham, and let's have a conversation. And you know, we're all we're all grown men. We can accept if you don't want us involved or not. But for the better, for the better of, of of the team moving forward, we need a conversation. Not not you know not right stuff on a yeah. It's pathetic. Those, those things pathetic. are so fraught. We we, we had uh, believe it or not back in twenty ten, I think it was Daily Telegraph, where I then worked. We won some sort of newspaper of the year award, and that was the year that PR decided to do three sixty reviews, and everybody piled in with a three sixty review, and it was horrendous. Yeah. And yeah. everybody's talking straight, well, getting, getting everything off their, you know, yeah. they've been dying to say well, for the last 18 yeah. months. That's why yeah. they didn't do it again. No, no, nothing good. From, from, I'm trying to think, but not that I've been involved in that, in those sort of things many times, but 
from experience, nothing positive ever comes out of a of, of a question, an anonymous questionnaire like that. Mark, I want to ask you about Chris Ashton um, for yeah. obvious reasons. It seems like that may well have been the last we see of him on a professional rugby field. Yeah. Do you think the red will be overturned? I don't know if you've seen it. I've not seen it, you know. Um, I, I didn't even know. Um, <clears throat> the only... So I obviously work at all the the home... The Sharks home games. And I've, I've worked on whatever day, whatever day the game was... Um, on the weekend, Saturday maybe, and I don't even think I watched a minute of our game because they end up just chatting to people and whatever else. Um, you see the you see the half time score and the, and the final score, and that's about it. And then on Sunday, there's a there's a big coronation celebration there. They they shut the you know the the road that runs through the village. They they slit all of pedestrian eyes. Um, it was a it was a brilliant sort of afternoon down here, and I and I and I bumped into Wiggy. Here, but he had his missus was poorly, so she was she was she was back home, and he was he was doing the the honourable husband thing, and brought all three kids out on his own, and his um his youngest Margot was going absolutely wild, so he ended up only staying for about twenty minutes and, and going home. But in that twenty minutes, I didn't even know Leicester had got beaten, and um, obviously I found out they got beaten, and, and then he told me that Ash had been red carded. So I jokingly was like, well, it, at least it makes one easy decision on selection for, for, for the semi-final because we'd already talked um, about, obviously, I'd sort of, everything sort of centres around the back three for obvious reasons. And and um, we had conversations with Wiggy about how we, you know, how he selects his back three when when there's four or however many of them all playing well and um, everything else. So that was why... My initial comment was, well, at least it takes one <laughs> it takes one decision out of your hands. Now I'm I'm guessing um well it, it could I don't know when's the hearing? Is it is it even like I've not even seen the incident, is it likely that it can be overturned and it'd be available for Saturday Sunday or not? I know Brendan and Chris, you didn't see it. I did I haven't see seen it, I don't know. Nick, have you seen it? Yeah, I but fleetingly. Um yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure that that one will be overturned. Mm. I think the only thing was that Merley was dipping a little bit, but it was. Yeah. Really so I think. Um, I think it'll be. Uh, let's say. Let's say it doesn't get overturned, and and that that's it. Um, it'd be a real shame. It'd be a real shame. Saying that, my final game was at Exeter away, last ever game. Best of rugby and Wayne Barnes sin me, me with with about six minutes left on the clock. <laughs> so I'm um, I'm eternally in the sin bin. Um, but no, I, I, listen, I love I love Ashley to bits. I think people sort of people um, sometimes maybe have the wrong opinion of him. I'm a I'm a is is a bit of a is a bit of a love or hate him, don't you? Um, He's obviously a bit of a, a knobhead at times on the on the pitch in his in his early days, and he never he never really seemed to grow up, did he? <laughs> but um, I'll never forget that that punch that he took off Manu at Leicester when he was playing for Sarries. Um, fair fair play, he took some shots, but listen, at the end of the day, he's, he's you know, well the numbers the numbers say everything. He's the, he's the best he's the best finisher around. He's just just incredible. I think. You know the way he he and people still can't do it now. I think it's one it's one thing. Somebody some players bring in new things, techniques, ideas to the to the game, um, and other and others following. You know, like I sometimes wish. You know, we see all the all. You know, if you're in the corner now, people jumping in the air and, and putting the ball down with the whole body off the floor. You know, nobody was doing that in 2007, and maybe if, if they were, maybe I'd have, I could have scored it. Yes, have scored it before. We got there in the end, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang on, Mark. You did score, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, don't, that, Mark, that's let it go. Record. That's off the record, Ali. Mark, um, Mark, let it, Mark, let it go. Let, just, just let it. Just, just let off, it. Chris. <laughs> just let it go. Um, what was I getting? So the point I was trying to make 
I think, you know, he, he's come onto the scene and he's had this unbelievable ability to just track the ball and pop up nine times out of ten in the middle of the field, running down the middle of the field and seems to get onto that last pass and and and, and run, you know, run under the sticks to score a try. And I, I don't think anybody's been able to emulate it. It, it, it was almost... Like a like a sixth sense that he was born with. It was it was just an incredible skill. Um, you know, he, he was maybe his defense. You know, his de- defensive part of the game wasn't his strongest, but it certainly wasn't weak. Um, he could do a job. All the all these other basics were brilliant. His you know his catching catching high balls, his positional play, his kicking. He, he had it all, but you know, there's no one near him. Nobody near him in terms of being able to finish a try. Just, just crazy, crazy good. Is he, is he the nearest thing, Mark, that that um, that you've seen to what you would describe as a purely instinctive rugby player? Possibly, possibly, yeah. Um, I think he, he probably doesn't get enough credit for how much work, working, you know, as in studying and analysis. And well, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Is more to his game? I mean, I mean, you're suggesting there's, no, there's more I to think it. Yeah, he's he's far more intelligent. Don't judge a book, book by its cover. He's, he's, he's far more he's far more intelligent than he comes across. <laughs> um, no, I think he he works he works brilliant, massively hard, massively hard and. And I think that was, you know, I never, I never saw him at club level with Sarries, but you know, just knowing a, a lot of the lads over the years that spent a lot of time in Sarries, you know, that was something that I think they instilled in their players. You know, you know, you, you've you've got to work hard off the not off the field, but mm. in terms of in the in the classroom, you know, you, you've 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 got to understand what you're doing and you've got to understand what you're up against. You've got to understand, you know, the the more knowledge and, and understanding of anything. You know, you, whatever business you're in, or rugby for this case, you know the the, the better position you're going to put yourself in. And, and I think, yeah, no, I think that's something that he probably is credited with. Um, you know, his his naturally his natural ability is 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 unbelievable. You know, he's he's rapid, he's rapid, but he's equally very fit. His his repeat speed's incredible. You know, you. Not, not, you know, Ugo, someone probably that's known for being really quick, you know, a real sort of athlete, but couldn't always repeat, repeat, repeat that speed. You know, you knew in the second half that Ugo would always sort of drop off. He'd, he'd lose that yard or that inch that he would have in the first half. But, you know, Ashley didn't, he didn't, whether it was the first. Well, answer me this, Mark. When, when you yeah. were playing in the England... England back three with yeah. Chris Ashton and Hugo Monier. Yeah. Who was the brains of the unit? Well, come on, mate. There's, a, there's only one Man United fan in that in that back three, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not a good thing at the moment either, is it? Yeah. No, there was I mean, certainly there was only there's only me with I I've got you my name at but... fullback and you got moved to fullback, didn't you? Um after yeah, it makes me laugh. I love Oogs. I love Oogs. He's a good mate of mine. And, you know, we, we stay in touch of stuff. And uh, down at Twickenham for the last for the last game in the Six Nations, whatever game that was, Scott, not Scotland, France game. Was it France? Anyway, and um, obviously with him being on TV now, the, my I've got three boys. And they're nine, uh, 12, nine and four. So they... I, Took them all down in the wife to the last game, and we sort of made a weekend of it and stuff. And, um, I was working in one of the suites, and Oogs was in the suite after, so we we're chatting away. And my boys were just like, "Who's going on you?" I don't know. <laughs> Fuck off! I was better than him because <laughs> he's because he's obviously on TV um, every week. Is you know, it's a bit like Gary Lineker. Kids these days, they don't remember Gary Lineker for being one of the best strikers England ever had. It's Gary Lineker because he's, he's the man of the telly, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the kids were, like, having pictures with, with Ugo. And, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was nice. But that game that you, you mentioned there, John, it was, I think it was Jono's. Jono was in charge. And I think we played Argentina in the autumn. And Ugo was at fullback. 
and they just bombed him all day. And he couldn't catch a fucking cold. Honestly, there was there was one ball bounced off his shoulder. I don't think he got anywhere. One might have even bounced off his head. Uh, <laughs> so, so the following week, and I knew, I knew, I knew it was coming. I'm like, they're going to ask me to play fullback here because we didn't have. So there was myself, there was Hugo. I think Ben Cohen was in the squad, and I'm trying to think who the other back three was, but. Essentially, it, we were all 90% wingers. There was no 90% fullback that could play on the wing. And Jono, Jono came up to me Monday, Tuesday and was like, uh, and we had the All Blacks, we had the All Blacks the following week. And he said, uh, how do you feel about playing fullback next week against the All Blacks? And I'm like, fuck off. And um, <laughs> he said, well, we've, we've, we've sort of got nobody else. Um, you know, and obviously, Hughes isn't going to get picked. I was I was quite happy to play fullback. I, I think I played for certainly played for Sale quite a few times. I think I'd even played for England at, at, at fullback. So I think I, I think I said something like, "Well, listen, I'll I'll do it, but if I have an absolute shocker, you can't judge me off this one game because it's against the All Blacks." <laughs> watch, watch us. We'll be the judge of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so no, but it makes me laugh now when. We've got Hugo on, on BT Sport talking up like he was Jason Robinson, and I'm always like, "You forget that fucking game again, the Argentina kid." <laughs> I, I, I remember the, the Hugo bad game. I, I think you're right; it probably was against Argentina, and we were sitting in the back yeah. of the press box in Twickenham, and somebody shouted over wow. to me as he was having a bad game. So he shouted, out, yeah. "Oh, it's the new JPR Williams!" And a bloke in the <laughs> stand behind us said, "It's the new Shirley Williams." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, he he had a bad day. He had a terrible day that day. Oh, yeah. Right, you mentioned Jason Robinson there, and the yeah. with, with Chris Ashton, probably the two best pure rugby league, to, you know, um, con converts to union. Yeah. Tell us a bit about playing a career alongside Jason and seeing the the work he put into to learn yeah, the union yeah. skills because he really, in the end, he mastered everything. He was so naturally talented, and there, I never saw. I never saw him do a fitness test. I never saw him do a fitness test. Every, whether it was with Sale, whether it was with England, whether it was with the Lions. Mate, he turned up on a Lions tour in 05. Five weeks late because his missus was pregnant, right? And dropped straight into the test team without <laughs> playing, in a, playing in a fucking midweek game. I'm like, this guy's different level. Um, just that uh, you, you get, uh, and I think it was one of the questions on that list, Ollie, you get asked all the time, you know, um, um, favourite, best best player you've played with, best player you've played against. And literally, there's no hesitation. He, you know, whenever I get asked, the best player I've ever played with is fucking Jason Robinson, mate. Just, just a different, different gravy. Like, I, I can't even tell you how good he is. Just... Um, yeah, just un unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable, and a, and a and a and a great bloke with it. You know, he's st um, still seen regularly. He, he he works on a match day for Sell Sharks as well. Um, doesn't look a day older than he did when he retired, little bastard. Um, but no, just 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 a brilliant bloke. Just I remember, you know, he, he took me under his wing quite early. You know, the early days at Sell, the, that back three for. Probably the near, nearly a decade was obviously myself, Robbo, and Steve Hanley. and um, we had a we had a right laugh. We had a right laugh. Um, but again, yeah, he, he yeah, he, 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 that, that, I can't say a bad word about him. He, I would tell you, he never did a fitness test, right? And I, I'll never forget doing a one rep max test in the gym as well. And me and so we were me, Stan, and Robbo would always work together in the gym. And um, I'll never forget one year, you know, you're doing your bench one rep max and you, you work, you start on 100 and you do a couple of reps, but you don't do too many because you want to save your energy and you work your way up. And um, we've probably been on the bench 10 minutes and we've, we've worked our way up. Stan was strong. So out of the three of us, I was the weakest out there, out of the three, right? But I, I did about 150, 150 on the bench press, one rep max. And just as I squeeze out this 150, my fucking arms are shaking everything. 
Robbo runs up. He's been in the sauna for an hour. And we're all like, Robbo, where have you been? We've fucking, we've been grafted here for 45 minutes. He's like, oh, 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 what's what's on there? What's on there? I says, 150. And he, and he said, and he said, oh, what, what, what's your, what, what have you done? What's your best? And I'm like, ah, that's me, done. I've worked from 130 up to 150. There's no way I can I can do another another kilogram. Um, I said, do you, want us, do you want us to take some weight off just for you to build up? He said, no, 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 leave that 150 on. Leave that 150 on. Jumps on the thing and bangs out about three on 150. And uh, I'm like, mate, what the, f- I'm like, what the f-? he's not even warmed up. He's been in the sauna for an hour. And uh, he said, um, he said, oh, stick, stick five on. I'll do one on that. Because that beats you. I'll leave it at 155. And just, <laughs> just left it at 155 because it beat me. But just a freak, just an absolute freak of a, of a bloke. Just said he never, he never did fitness. He never did. He worked hard in training on the field but all the time. And he and he did a lot of extras, you know, his kicking and his catching. And... He did some kicking, didn't he? Because I remember when he played those matches for Bath, he, he couldn't kick for Toppy. And yet by the end of his career, he was doing 50-yard spirals. Yeah, uh, yeah. Definitely worked on that aspect. Definitely worked. Dave Holbrook, excuse me. Uh, Dave Holbrook, the, the, um, the kicking coach, kicking coach for England at the time, and, um, did, a lot, did a lot of work with him. And I, do you remember Dave? Why, why did you start your? Why did you start yawning when you mentioned Dave? <laughs> I've got a brilliant story about Dave. What a legend he is, right? I've not been in the England team that long, and I, I my background was football, football, so I could always kick a rugby ball, but the technique was totally different. So I couldn't. I wasn't getting the best sort of strike, for want of a better term, when I was when I was hitting a rugby ball. Um, so I spent a lot of time with Dave. And then, and then this first coming into the England setup, like 045, that sort of time. And this guy, he'd never wear he'd never wear like England kit. He just he's obviously all, always been sponsored by Adidas. So he'd have full head to toe fucking three strike kit on, right? And I never forget. And it was, I think it was an autumn, so it was like November down in Pelio. And it's it's like minus three degrees. On a, on a Monday morning, and there's there's like a, a couple of inches of snow on the pitch. It's fucking freezing, and um, me and Robbo were doing some kicking to each other. And um, Dave stood behind me, and um, he stood there again. He's not moved. He's not moved for twenty minutes. It's fucking minus three. It's freezing. I'm like, if he if he tries to kick the ball, he's probably gonna shatter. His, his legs gonna be. His legs just gonna snap. Anyway, he's telling me, and I'm I'm not, I'm just not hitting the ball well at all. I'm not hitting it at all. He says, right, come here, give me the ball. You stand behind me where I've been stood watching you and watch watch what I do here. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't fucking wait for this. He's gonna, <laughs> he's, it, it'll be like kicking a bag of cement, this. He's, he's been stood there for that long. It's minus three. He bounces around and hops about like this. He's a proper prima donna, isn't he? And then, Anyway, he fucking drops the ball and he spiral fucking leathered this ball about 95 metres, the tightest, cutest. So we're we're in the five metre channel, the touch, touch line on the right and the five metre channel on the left. And he kept it within the five metres for literally like from, from 22 to 22. I'm like, holy shit, who, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Dave, I think Dave put some hours in with Robbo as well. And um, again, he wasn't, you know, he's a, he's a, I try to teach my my lads all play rugby and my middle one's about got it. You know, when Robbo, he used to sort of flow and somehow it's it, it whip his head and then go. And then go. Um, his natural ability running with the ball. I've never seen anyone run sideways or backwards as quick as they can run forwards. Robbo can Robbo can do it. But his his kicking was always quite um not what was the word? Not regimented, quite um not not as natural as his as his running and stuff. But he could he could leather a ball, yeah. Let's use Jason Robertson as the avenue into the quick fire 15 questions. Um, yeah. I suppose, well, we'll gloss over the two of it. Best player you've played against is Jason Robinson as well. Or, or someone else. Yeah, the, the, the against. 
this it's always a lot harder than the the best player I've played with is Robbo without a doubt. Again, it's, there's just too many. There's just too many. Um, Shane Williams was just diff, different level. Um, he could he could skin you in a phone box. He was that he was you know probably the closest thing to Robbo um, there was. But you know. Some of, yeah, you know, I remember playing against Brian Banner in his first. He he came off the bench at Twickenham for his first cap, and uh, I think he was only on the field for ten minutes, opposite my wing, and um, scored in his. I think his first touch of of, of, of Test rugby then to you know to, to him to go on and do what he did was incredible. So, and then the, you know some of the some of the Aussie and, and, and New Zealand Kiwi wingers just. You know, Joe Rock and Coco, Debbie Howler, Cindy Sidivanti, just the, you know, how do you, how do you pick one of, of them lot? Yeah. How good, how good was Sidivanti, Mark? He, he was, oh. what, what Warren Gatlin described him as the most talented player he'd ever coached. Yeah, just, just different. Like, again, I'd, I'd tell a story on 2005 Lions and, um, I didn't get into that test team till that final test and, Sivy, Sivy started on the opposite wing. It was like, and he was on fire. He was on fire. I think, I think he'd, he'd got something ridiculous, like 50, 15 caps for New Zealand at the time, and he'd scored something like twenty five tries in fifteen caps. Just, just dirty, dirty feet, just power, just everything. And um, so he was starting off. I was on the right wing. He was on the left wing for New Zealand, and and um, after about sixty minutes. The, the score, obviously, you know, we were we'd already lost the series and we went on to lose that game. But it was all just about trying to, you know, bring a bit of pride and, you know, if we can nick a win, then then we'll try and do it. But the, the All Blacks were just in crazy form at the time, and um, yeah, as I think we spent an, an hour with him running at me, um, and on about the hour mark, I think they were they were ahead, but not. You know, it wasn't a silly score. I think there were maybe a try ahead or, a, a, you know, a, a penalty ahead. And after 60 minutes, the All Blacks replacement board went up and it, and it had number 11 on it. And I was like, throw the phone up for that. Sibby's, Sibby's going off for the last 20 minutes. But he went off and Joe Rock and Coco came on for the, for the last 20. I was like, oh my God, what chance have you got? <laughs> Well, let's gloss over those two questions then and start at the beginning. Um, nickname? Mine? Yeah. Quakes, Squarehead, Boxhead. <laughs> Conquer Ashy, Ashy, Ashy and Foads and all them boys used to call me Conquer Tree towards the end of my career. As Con in old Conquer Tree, yeah. Oh, I was okay. as, as, old, as old as a... <laughs> Best rugby memory? Again, just I think all your debuts. I remember my debut for sale like it was yesterday. Again, playing back three, we played Bristol away. Um, me, Robbo, Stan. I scored a try and we won. We won our first game, so that was my first ever professional game. Obviously, debut for England, Lions, World Cup final, Premiership final with sale. Just yeah, there's just too many. Yeah, that's a pretty, pretty decent list. Most embarrassing rugby memory? Most embarrassing? Not spotting me in that tree in Dunedin. <laughs> Most embarrassing moment? I, I don't, I really couldn't, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I don't really have one. I'm trying to think of something silly that might have happened or we'll maybe come back to that, mate. Pre-game food. <laughs> pre-game food was always... Your pre-game chew. Um, chew. I always would always listen to... Um, I should know it, because how many times did I listen to it on my career? It was a Black Eyed Peas. Um, what was the name of it? I'll get the name of the song. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to start... So you, you, you lot wouldn't know it anyway. Um... Do I look like someone who's ever heard of a black eye? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, not at all. Um, it was a black eyed peas tune, but I can't remember the, the title of it, but I'll let you know. Boom Boom Power was a famous, one of the famous ones, which could be. Mm. No, it wasn't that. No. 
Um, post game meal. Post game meal. I don't, no, there wasn't. It, I was. I was a funny one, man. I couldn't really eat for hours after playing. Um, Pre game was. I had a million superstitions, and and one of my one of my superstitions was my pre match, and that was always um, beans on toast with two poached eggs. Nice. What was the reason behind that? No idea. No idea. I still love it. Beans on toast with two poached eggs now. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite player right now? Um, I think on on form, on his, on his day. Um, I can't remember his first name. Smith. Smith for oh. Quinn's the 10. Marcus Smith. Marcus, I think, on his... On his you know, when he's pulling out that magic, um, he's, he's brilliant to watch. Um, however, will he be an international, an international solid 10? I don't know. Um, well, I was going to ask about George Ford and I was going to ask you, Chris, he's looking pretty good since he's come back from injury, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you you know what I think about George Ford. I mean, I mean, I I think he's the best ten in the country um, yeah. as a game yeah. as a game managing ten. I I think he's he's absolutely magn- and and I mean, Mark will know more about this than me, but he seems to have absolutely grown into the leadership role on the field. And, yeah. and he, he was a bit of a leader when he was about eight, wasn't he? When he yeah. first when he first started playing, and he hasn't grown an inch since he was eight either. It seems yeah. to me. Um, and and. No. Uh, there's all stuff around his defence and what have you, but I still think that in a tight game, if I'm looking for someone to take me home, I think George is as good as anyone in the country. But well, well we this might... is going to be this this next couple of um, of weeks is going to be the uh, the telling time, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, Nothing. yeah, yeah. It reminds me a lot, lads, of of Charlie Hodgson. Absolutely. And the, yeah. the way the way the way he moves and the way he passes and. It's it's like watching fucking Charlie 10, 15 years ago. Um I think it's it's a, it's a, it's it's amazing, isn't it? You know, you think it's not you, you think during, you know, Ch- there was always Charlie and, and Wilco, right? And and Charlie was you, you know, you you your natural flair sort of attacking, he could pass a ball better than anyone, you know, but Johnny was Johnny and you know, would smash people in D, would organise well in in, a, in attack and everything else, but kick his goals. And it's a bit, it's a bit like you know whether it's whether it's Owen Farrell and Fordy, or whether it's Owen and Marcus Smith. It, it it's almost a, a very similar sort of comparison, isn't it? Of, of the two of the two eras, you know, you've, you've got you've got Owen, you know, who's never going to let you down. You know, Jem Rano's kicking hasn't been as, as as nailed on in the last twelve months as it always was. But you know, he's going to slot his goals from everywhere. He's going to smash everyone that runs in front of him, and he's going to organise and manage the team well. But is he going to do? You know, is he going to you know get a backline going like a Ford can or a Marcus Smith can? You know, he's ne- he's never going to do that. He's you know he's a different sort of player. Um, but at that top at that top top level. Yeah, it sort of grates me to say it, but I know I know who I'd have in I know who I'd have in my team every day of the week. No, it doesn't grate me to say it because I love I love Faz, he's a top lad, but it's it's amazing, isn't it, how we we fantasize about playing the game and with flair and excitement and da, 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 but again, you know, and it's probably not a great thing for the game, but I remember, you know, 05, 06, we sell won the league, the one and only time we've ever won the league. And for three years prior to that, myself, Stan, Robbo, we were scoring dozens of tries every year. The, the year we won the league, I was a top, I was sales top try scorer with four. But but no one gives a fuck because we won the league. <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather score no tries and win the league than score a dozen tries and not win it. Do you know what I mean? Um, the thing is, you got you got you got three you got three, the three three sort of England contender outside us that you mentioned. 
They've yeah. all got different strengths and weaknesses, and they've all they all have things that you would love in your side. You would yeah. love in your side. If if you can put them all together, you end up with Daniel Carter. But that's once in a generation. Yeah. Um, you know, Carter could do sort of pretty much everything. Uh, yeah. It just depends on what you least want to lose, it seems to me, in your selection. And there's a whole chunk of Farrell's game that you just don't want to lose. Yeah, yeah. no, there, exactly. there is. But I mean, if you if you're trying to think about um about the way a team plays. Um, there is a there's a symmetry to the idea of having two um, ball you know real ball playing uh, running threat fly halves and Ford and Marcus Smith are those two yep. Farrell's the odd man out so it mm. you know these are the things that coaches have to you know have to define yeah. and how quick how easily do you switch from a game with a fly half like Marcus Smith to a game like Owen. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Farrell plays. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, what what um what intrigues me moving on from the fly half thing is the back three, uh, quotes. How do you see the England back three at the moment? Do you you know, what do you feel is the best balance there? Do you feel that they're missing out on on anyone? Yeah. And, um, you I, know, I don't. <clears throat> yeah. I, do you know what, mate? It, it all those things. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't pick. There's, you know, you've always got maybe nailed, nailed two, nailed on out of three, haven't you? Generally, um, obviously, um, oh, his name just left me. The fullback from Leicester, Stuart. Stuart, he is obviously your one nailed on. I think, I think he's he's been brilliant. Um, but in terms of the in terms of the wings, there's no one really, really sort of sticking their hand up and saying this is this is my spot. You know, whether you look at you know Johnny May's sort of fallen out of out of out of favour, Jack Knowles, you know, injured a lot. Anthony Watson, oh, he, he, he's he's done all right, but I don't know. And and he. Without sort of labelling players, and and I, and I hate labelling, but in 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 doesn't seem to be quite his old self, you know, since his Achilles injuries. Um, Arundel, you know, look looks good, but is he ready to really, you know, you know, control take take control of a of a of a of a wing spot? Um, who else is there? You got you got Maidens, you got Maidens, haven't you? Who's, who's seems May, to be yeah. extremely extremely good going forward, you know, on his best yeah. days. But defensively, he can be. That's what I mean. There's not, there's not, yeah. Got a couple of interesting lads at sale there. You know, I mean, at forward, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Carpenter and Roebuck as well. You know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, they feel they're coming. They're doing, they're doing really well. And there's a, there's another kid called Reed and Carpenter's Carpenter's come from nowhere. To be fair. Um, he's done brilliantly well, and then we've got Roebuck and Reed. But I was championing, I don't know, two, two odd years ago. But they, they sort of burst onto the scene, but never really sort of took sort of bull by the horns, if 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 you know what I mean. And they've they sort of, sort of bubbled away a little bit until this season and back end of last season and this season have, have both really. You know, stepped up to the mark and, and look 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 good. Um, I think Robux he's in, he's been invited into the squad. He's, he's been around that environment. He's trained with the with the squad and stuff. So I think for them boys, there's there's no better time for them to really to push on because no, normally, you know, you, you try to dislodge bloke. You know, when I thinking back to when I played, you know, you, you had Cohen, Lucy. And Robbo, they were the back three, and they they played 30, 40 games consistently back to back, and it's like how the fuck am I going to knock one of these like out out of position? Um, you know, I was, you know, I was flying, scoring tries, doing everything for fun, but couldn't couldn't get in that team for love of the money, and and you know, as frustrating as it was at the time, in hindsight, I, I get it now, but you know, if you, if I was if I was a winger now. Looking at you know the opportunity in terms of the back, certainly the wings. Um, you know, I've been I've been rubbing my hands together. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. The door is very much open. I am going to um, put you on the spot and ask you at, after the round of rugby 15 what your back three for England would be should the World Cup final be tomorrow. Yeah. Crack your brains for that. Um, yeah. Back to the round of rugby 15. Could Mark. double up as your most embarrassing rugby moment, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, good, very good. I miss you, Chris. I miss you, mate. <laughs> Who was your rugby idol? You... <laughs> Do you know what? I did. I didn't really have one because um, I, I, I didn't. I was I was football football through through till about fifteen, sixteen. So I, it, you know, I, I watched a bit of rugby, but I didn't. Uh, it wasn't like I was mad on it. Um, I was more sort of, I was more more football, really. Um, Who's your football idol? <sighs> Who's my football idol? Alan Shearer. Not United, then. No. Um, I, yeah, Alan Shearer. I'm, I'm, yeah, he was the man, money. He still is the man. How long's he been inside? He still owns the record, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. Unless uh, Harlan, Harlan on current form, mate. He might have it wrapped up in two or three seasons if he keeps going. <laughs> <He's> going. <laughs> that kid's off the rails, isn't he? Yeah, it's crazy. I think, well, Harry yeah. Kane's not too far behind Shira now as well, but I think if Hart, Harlan stays in the Kane's game. weird, though, isn't he? Like, is he that good? He doesn't, he doesn't come across that good, does he? I know he scores goals, but wow. He must be. He must be. What do I know? Favourite stadium? Um... Twickenham, obviously, but um, the favourite away stadium, Millennium, every every day of the week, just absolute carnage with the roof shut. They'd always have a late kickoff so that everyone's levered, absolutely steaming drunk by the time you get in there. We'll never have a, never played at three o'clock in, at, at Millennium, never ever. There's always a five or seven o'clock kickoff. Um, but yeah, what about that brilliant atmosphere? And, the sh- and Gloucester. Gloucester. I love playing at Gloucester, getting some stick off the shed. Favourite gym exercise? Bench. Well, one fifth. I enjoyed when you said, and Chris raised his eyebrows when you said this, that you just start out with a few easy reps at 100. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it now, mate. 100, 100 kills me now. <laughs> Occupation if rugby didn't exist. Um, in stone and fiber into apartment blocks. <laughs> I, I always wanted to. Um, I always wanted to go to the RAF. Um, my my great uncle, who played, he played for Warrington Wolves during the war, and he and um, there's a really nice touch down at the the, the Warrington Stadium in in one of the concourses. I don't know if you boys ever get. I've never been there, but in one of the concourses, they've, they've done this big timeline going back like 150 years, and um, there's a there's a part of it that um, obviously during the First World War, Second World War, um, about 10, 10 lads that were playing regularly for Warrington Wolves, the t- the team got decimated in the war, and a 10 out of the 30 lads got killed at war, and um, they've got like gravestones. Um, in the in the concourse of this timeline, and um, my great uncle was um, was a pilot in the in the in the war, and he got shot down and killed, and he was playing for Warrington. So they they invited me over when they got this this timeline finished, and um, presented me with um, with a plaque, um, and his names his names there on the wall and stuff. So. Um, nice. Yeah, it's amazing. Really nice little touch. Um, so I, I actually, when I was when I finished school at sixteen, I went to RF Cromwell and did a week sort of testing, aptitude physical testing, all that sort of stuff. And my plan was to go to uni and, and join as an officer after uni. But then my my rug, that's when my rugby sort of took off and changed um, changed tracks. Have you learned? Have you learned how to fly, Mark? Have you? Had to talk to- I, I haven't, you know, I not from, I, I not from what we were watching down the years, no. <laughs> <laughs> my um, my missus actually um, got me some some flying lessons. And, uh, as long as she doesn't watch this, I've never ever, you know, when you you, you get like a, 
I think the first few times I tried to put them in, it, but the weather wasn't good or it was too windy or it was whatever. And then they were just losing interest and never, <laughs> never ever put them in. I just spent like hundreds to get me like, a, you know, like a basic sort of yeah. whatever, five lessons or five whatever. Yeah. So no, I've never done it, but it's also Matthew Tate. There's a few lads that got the helicopter licenses. Um, Matthew Tate, Ben Cohen, they can, they've all got their chopper licenses. And then there's um, a guy, you, you won't know him. Um, I forget his name now as well. Um, you certainly won't know him. I can't remember his name. He, <laughs> you don't know the, him either. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, I, I actually don't, Chris, right? But you know when you bump into someone and they're like, oh, I played rugby with you in Sales Academy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 25 years ago. Like, I'm going to remember him. I think he played two games in the academy. Um, but he uh, he's a pilot now for EasyJet. So, there you go. Very good. I've lost where I am. Uh, superstitions. Oh, man. Like how so. are you? <laughs> yeah, how too many. Too, yeah, too many. Just from the, from the night before, you know, always having a bath, always having Epsom salts. Never have a... Only once a week I'd have a bath and it was the night before the game, it was Epsom salts. The morning of the game, I'd always have a wet shave. I'd never wet shave. I'd never had a wet shave since I finished playing rugby. Um, pretty much meal. Back back left of, of, of the bus, same seat and the bus, last out the changing rooms. <laughs> but left left boot on foot. I remember my first cap foot for England and I wasn't I wasn't on the back left. But I was as close to it as I could get. It was my first game. I couldn't be fucking throwing my weight about. And um, we pull up outside Twickenham, and everyone's getting off the bus. And I was always last off, last off the bus, last off the last out the changing room. And um, I'm sat there, and I've, I've got my headphones on, and waiting for everyone to get up. And I look around, and Will Greenwood's still at the back. Me and him are having like a fucking standoff because it. He, I, <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't know that he had this, uh, the same superstition of being off the bus last as, as I did. I was, I was looking at each other. I'll tell, I'll tell you what, <laughs> sounds by the time by the time you see, got to the game, you must have been a nervous wreck. <laughs> yeah, see, see, he was going to crack. See, he was going to crack first, but fair, fair play. He came up to me and he was like. You want to be off the fucking bus last day? You superstition, and I'm like, yeah, do you? And he went, yeah. And uh, fair play, he, he'd probably got like sixty fucking caps by this point. And he went, go on. As, as soon as it's your first cap, yeah, and he he walked off and he let me he let me go off first. So uh, that was a nice touch. But which time England with twenty nil down? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Quay, did that mess with your head? If, if you missed one of those superstitions, can you actually put yeah. down the performance? To missing money or little I never, I never had I never had a bad game, Brendan. I never had oh, a bad well, game. Uh, <laughs> one of your more mediocre or average. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know what? There was never a time when I never got never got one of them one of them one of the superstitions in. One of the big ones at Twickenham was line up to sing the national anthem. And I all I all my mum and dad were at every game. And I always had to, you knew generally, you know, they were, in that, they were in that sort of certain block behind the coaches, you know, prime sort of seating. But you didn't know exactly where they were going to be. And there's, you know, there's maybe 100 people there. And I always had to find my mum and dad. I don't even know why, you know, they didn't do it in, in any other games. It was only at Twickenham um, for England. Um, and as soon as the anthem's finished, you're whipping your, your jacket off, you're putting some spray around, last sort of touches before you go in and get into position. And I remember at one one game, I hadn't, I couldn't fucking find them. So I, I think the whole team are ready to receive the kickoff. And I'm still stood there with my jacket on. I'm not even took my jacket off trying to find them. Um, but I managed it's, to find them, yeah. There's definitely a flaw in the system, isn't there, putting p players' parents anywhere near the coach's box. Because all they're, yeah. all they're going to hear for 18 minutes is people saying, look at that bloody idiot. Why the hell did yeah. I pick him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Drops another fucking ball. <laughs> Rugby law you would change? Ah, There's just too many, isn't there? I, Rugby law I would change now. The scrub, just the, something around the scrub, just um, 
you know, the whole, I don't know enough about it and the game. I, I played the game for 15 years pro and, and I watch it now. You've got speculators and they're like, why why is that penalty? What, what are they giving the penalty for there? And I'm like, I think you know no idea. Um, the game's so complicated, isn't it? Um, but I think, you know, we talk about trying to make it more exciting, make it more attacking, more tries, more points, you know, all that, which is great. <clears throat> and I'm all for, but then we still we still sit and watch a fucking reset scrum for 10 minutes. And it's like, what are we doing? So, I don't know, some, something around, I can't give you a specific rule, but, you know, it's something around the scrum and speeding the game up. and Yeah, making um, sure that the scrum forms. You know, it, I mean, the amount of time it takes to form up a lot of the time. I mean, yeah. they're trying to move on this season, but they've got to yeah. get much stricter on it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Last thing, best thing about working in rugby. The people, mate. The people. You, I, I. You, you spoil. You spoil. You with. You with the top. You with the top one percent in the in the in in the in the industry. You know. You, the, the, my biggest frustration, you know, working in an office here now, and I know you need people, but the the, the people that just in rugby you've you've got the best of the best everyone's driven everyone's motivated everyone's singing up the same sheet everyone was the same everyone's trying their hardest da, 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 da. you come in the office and yeah there's you know maybe one or two like that but then 90 percent just just aren't um and i sometimes wish i could be like that and just be happy and consent and come into work earn my money and go home but um but I'm not. Um, so, yeah, the, the, there's no, there's no knobheads. Because <laughs> uh, if 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 you are a knobhead, you get you get turfed out early. So you, you either change or you get fucked off. So I think everyone talks. Everyone talks about missing the change room banter and, and all that lot. And it and it is that there is an element of that. But it, it it's the whole. It's the whole environment. There's nothing. There's nothing like it, you know. Um, the the people are just top top performers, massively driven. Everyone wants the same. Awesome. Well, your time has come, Mark. If the World Cup final was tomorrow and now <laughs> England were in it, who is yeah. in the back three for England? <sighs> we already said Stewart, would... Stewart's nailed on at fullback. Stewart's nailed on at fullback. I'm going to put Anthony Watson on one wing and I'm going to put Tom Roebuck on the other. Oh, he's been in there. <laughs> no, it's been a lot Yeah, yeah. He's in great form, to be fair, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how he scored that try. That, I, did you see the, that the try? That was amazing try. I mean, people talk about Freddie he, Stewart in here. Tom Roebuck. He didn't, that was amazing. He didn't, yeah, he didn't sort of break stride. He didn't jump. He literally just took his hands out, and I know he was up against the nine. I think was it was it yeah, the scrum half. So there's always going to be one winner there, but still, it was it was incredible how he did it. Fair play to him. Speaking of the World Cup, so you're involved with Clarity Travel and Sports, yeah. sports Jokes. Is that right? <laughs> they are. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're a the official travel agent for the World Cup this year. Yeah, they're they're an official travel and ticket provider to the to the World Cup. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about it, if you can. Um, yeah, they've 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 got certain packages, you know, for hotels, for games. There's there's varying, you know, from sort of your basic package, your gold, your silver, your platinum, all that sort of stuff. Um, I've actually worked. They've they've been a a, a client of sales for a long time. So they, they do all the clubs to, you know, the team travel to Bath or to Gloucester. They do all the travel and the, and the accommodation. Um, so I've had a good relationship with them for, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> and then off the back of obviously them winning the contract to be one of the official providers, um, they, um, they approached me with obviously the history of, of, 07 and um, and the World Cup that I obviously played in, in France 
So um, it was a it was an obvious partnership. So yeah, I've I've been I've been helping them sort of promote and and sell packages for the last. I think it was probably about two years ago that they they got an, like officially awarded. Um, so it's just been helping sort of promote the various packages and deals and trips that that they've got. Um, are you, you going to give people a guided tour of that corner of the Stade de France um, and just that little stretch of the touchline? It, it depends how much you you've got to uh, how deep your pockets are, mate. That's the platinum tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, if anyone listening is planning their World Cup t- um, trips, then England, Ireland, Wales and Scotland packages for tickets, travels and hotels are now available via www.sportsbreaks.com forward slash rugby hyphen world hyphen cup hyphen 2023. So go check that out. Sorry, that was a lot of words in one go. Um, it's known as a plug in in the trade. Yeah, I know. Well, there's no there's no non pluggy way to do it. Um Shall we shall we preview the semi-finals <laughs> if if we've got 10 minutes, Mark, if that suits yeah, I yeah, I need to I've got to jump on the call at 12 if that's all right. right. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um well I don't really know how to go about it because I had a proper like 40 minute section dedicated to this. Um <laughs> we can, no, we can... gonna win. let's well who's gonna win, obviously, but Mark, I'll I'll come to you um going back to your last sale premiership win. And Sale are obviously looking as strong as they have since then. Um, yeah. I probably agree. Uh, what do you remember of that Tigers final and then it, the, the sort of dip and now the resurgence that's come since and how good they're looking? Yeah, it's, it's been a long time coming. Um, I think, obviously, it was brilliant. It was brilliant in 05. I, <clears throat> so I made my debut for Sale in, a, in a one, 2001. And... Um, we, um, I think the season before we'd finished tenth in the league or something. Um, that that season, my debut season, the likes of myself, sort of Charlie Hodgson. Um, I think Wiggy was, you know, knocking around in maybe a year or two early for for Wiggy. Um, but we ended up coming second in the league. There was no playoffs then. Uh, but we went from sort of ninth or tenth the season before to second in the league, and I think we won like a Parker Penn Shield or something like that. So it was a real sort of the start of a you know four or five years sort of build up to to that Premiership win. I think we won a we won a couple of European um, uh, Challenge Cups. Um, so we 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 sort of won two or three sort of. Bits of silverware up until the point, obviously winning the winning the final as well. And we had a we had a crazy crazy team, a real blend of sort of home homegrown talent, like like I said, the likes of myself. Wiggy Wiggy was Wiggy started at nine that day, I think. Charlie Austin, Deep Schofield, Andy Titchell, you know, a real good sort of backbone of English talent. Um, and then sort of a bit of stardust, sort of springing over the top with. You know, guys like um, Chabal, Bruno, Lobe. You know these these sort of overseas foreign foreign guys. There's obviously a, a big French um, contingency with 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 us having you know French head coach Philippe Andre. Um, you got Jason I mean, White as well. Was Jason playing then? I think big. Um, big Big Tam White, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a good. Yeah. It was a really strong side that cell. That cell side. You look at it on paper now. Mark, I think Mark Taylor was playing as well. It was a, uh, you know, Elvis Ravelli, uh, uh, Seviani, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tails. Yeah, Tails only. I think he was only at Sale for a year. He might have only done a year. He may have done two, but he won a Premiership in the in the, in the year that he was with us. So no, we had a we had a really good side. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't by any stretch exciting rugby to watch, but it was it was clinical. Um I think as I mentioned earlier, I scored four four tries and I was a top try scorer at the, at the club across the season. Robbo Robbo scored more he kicked more drop goals than he scored tries that season. And that is not even a joke because <laughs> Philippe was Philippe was mad. On 
get if you get into that opposition third, you've got to come away with points. Don't don't leave that third without points to the point of Robbo was sitting back in the pocket to take drop goals. Um what what was it with Philippe Marco? I mean he, he was as a player, he was yeah. he either scored or created two of the yeah. most famous tries ever scored in, in mm. international rugby. Yeah. And he was he was a hell of an attacking player, but he just had the sort of mind of a front rower, didn't he? I mean, what yeah, was, yeah. What, what, it, it, no. was, it was a strange mix, Philippe. Exactly that, exactly that. But that said, he would he would he would often pick out little bits in my game, as you'd expect, that that improved me massively. Yeah, yeah. But but in terms of yeah, his, his game plan. It, it worked. It worked all right. I think it well it worked then. Um he was he was very good at getting money out of owners. I think the previous owners, Brian Kennedy, he you know, we'd we'd had sort of Steve Diamond and Jim Mallander pr- prior to that, who, who didn't manage to build a squad that Philippe did. Philippe from day one was like, right, this is the squad I want. Um I think they get the, that that game plan now just doesn't doesn't work. I think the game's evolved so much more that you, you can't just have a, a big forward pack to dominate kicking corners and taking penalties and drop goals. That that was essentially the plan. Um when he you know, came out of that French, he came out of that French scene, didn't he? Where they they used to call French rugby the Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, and and and, and Philippe agreed agreed with. The, the, I mean, he lived that for his whole playing career. Yeah, but the Beast came first with Philippe. 100%. He wanted a big yeah. ball winning because it was because yeah. it was successful, mate. It was successful, yeah. and that's you know again going back to that mentality. It's. You know, would I would I rather score a million tries and come mid table or no tries and win the league? Fucking only one. There's only one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's and not what fair, the fans. You were the first team to win the regular season, yeah. and then fly off. And you blew Leicester away in the yeah. playoff. I mean, actually, you, you produced yeah. your best, oh. most fluent performance. Yeah. That was a mucky yeah. up day, and that they came third. They absolutely put them yeah. off the park. Yeah, we smashed them. We 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 put forty odd points yeah, on them. Twenty six, twenty, some of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think Austin Heady's last act as a professional rugby player was to throw an interception pass. <laughs> how, tragic that interception, is, how tragic is and that? that and, and listen, and this is another fucking true story, right? <laughs> my my brother-in-law is a massive gambler, and uh, he had a bet on on the the points difference. Not so it was going to say Sale would win. By 10 points, let's say, whether it was 30, 20, or 70, 60, it was 10 points. And the game was won, and we were within 10 points. And he's fucking, I think he had had 20 quid or 50 quid to win a grand or something ridiculous like this. That intercept was in the 85th minute. Um, Chris Mayer ran the length to score a try to take the points outside of 10. <laughs> so he, 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 he was the only guy in the post-match function after that wasn't fucking smiling. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Oh, man. We're very pushed for time, so I reckon for the yeah. finals, let's just get a prediction from everyone for the two winners. Um, Mark, I'll come to you first, because I know you need to dash. Who, who are the semis? <laughs> Sale versus Leicester, Sale at home, Saris versus North. Oh, Ham. sorry, sorry. I thought we were talking World Cup for a minute. Eh? Who's going to win the semis? Um, Sale, Saris. Sale, Saris. Is anyone? That's what I'm going with as well. Is anyone disputing that? Oh, I'm going to have a little. I think there might be a shock. I think Northampton have got a shock in them. Um, so, although Saris are favourites, if Northampton get away to a start, I think they could. Cause a major upset. I'm definitely going with Sale. They, they've got the pack to neuter Leicester, who also have a very good pack. Obviously, um, that'll be a, a, a an interesting contest. But yeah, Sale, Sale and Saints. Yeah, I, I've, um, I think Sale as well. Um, but I, I, I agree with uh, Bren that if there is an, an upset, it's going to happen at um, at Saracens because I think that. Um, Northampton have finally got a tight head. They've they've got Trevor Davison, and um, 
while he's you know he's been in and around the England squads, he's uh, he's a solid uh, customer, and they haven't really had that. Yeah. And uh, I think that that gives them with laws coming back as well. I think that that could be. I, I don't see Saracens being in quite the same light as they have been. They've got um, areas of their game that just don't work as well. It'll be very very tight, but I, I reckon Northampton could spring an upset. Interesting. Okay. Well, Chris, are you going sail and oh, no, no, I'm with Mark. Australia, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I didn't I was thinking how how are we gonna call it how are we gonna call winners when we don't know who's in it? <laughs> I'm, I'm taking no res I'm taking no responsibility for that. I don't know why that was made. Uh right, Mark. That was a journey. <laughs> um, yeah. That was a hell of a journey. Thank you so much. Um, for no coming and yeah, all the best with everything. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Good Cheers. to see you. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.